Okay, I'm gonna go grab something before we start. Okay. <sighs> Whoa. Whoa! What's going on? How did I end up back here? Whoops, I didn't send you back Wait, far no, 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 don't do it again! What was that? I don't know, you were right there and then you weren't. I was here? You were right there. But I was back there. That's so weird. Maybe if we go to the event, we'll find out more. Hi, I'm Roasting by an Open Fire. And I'm here to tell you all about Pathway's very special candlelight Christmas service, December 22nd at 10 a.m., with a very special Christmas pre-show happening 30 minutes before service at 9.30. What are you wearing? Hmm? You're, you're dressed just like me. It's just what I wear. Skin in the spirit. Are you trying to tell me something? I'm... Are you trying to tell me that I'm easily replaced? I didn't say that. Say listen, that. <laughs> there's only one roasting by an open fire. Hey, listen, let's not do this. Listen, I don't care if you're number one in jujitsu in the world. You wanna go? You wanna go? You don't. <laughs> right now? Let's go! We're gonna sing fun Christmas songs. The kids are gonna do an awesome Christmas performance called What God Wants for Christmas. And when we get to the candlelight section, we're gonna launch the lit candles out of like a t-shirt cannon, like do 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 do. You better grab it by the bottom nope. because if you grab it by the top, you're gonna burn nope. yourself. We're not gonna do, 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 do. We'll also have our Christmas red carpet as well as tasty hors d'oeuvres after service. Guess what we're gonna have? Don't. Do not lie to me and get my hopes up for no reason. Mini tacos. We're gonna have many. We're gonna have many tacos. And don't forget our special pre-service show starting at 9.30, which you can watch online or in person in the worship center. We're gonna have fun interviews. We're gonna tell you a little bit about what we're doing in 2025. We'll show some fun videos and more. We hope to see you at our special Christmas candlelight service December 22nd at 10 a.m. with the pre-service show starting at 9.30 a.m. We'll see you there. Hey. What did I tell you about trying to take my job? Take that coat off right now! Make Pathway part of your Christmas tradition by attending our Christmas candlelight service December 22nd at 10 a.m. with a special pre-service show starting at 9.30 a.m. Celebrate the reason for the season with friends and family at Pathway's Christmas candlelight service. No, no, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! I've just had a great idea. What if you kept the coat? The presence of God, powerful, uncontainable. His majesty beyond the limits of our universe. Yet in the stillness, he whispers. In his presence, we find peace. Worship is more than a song. It is our life surrendered. It's how we live it's the way we come before Him. Living in His presence, we encounter His power and His voice. The Almighty calls us close to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Living in His presence, we are transformed. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Pretty good? Is anybody cooking turkey yet? No? Okay, today. All right, I didn't get my invitation. I was just making sure you got it going on. Well, welcome if you are here for your first time at Pathway Church. You've already learned something very important to our culture here. We worship God exuberantly. And uh, we're, we're very gracious for what He's done in our lives. And we're going to talk about that today. But... Um, we also, we like to laugh at our church, believe it or not. And uh, one of our members um, showed up today and he knows, he knows my love of crazy shirts, okay? And, and he's our, David, you got to stand up. This is Chef David. He's a Michelin level chef. But look at that shirt right there. That dude wore a turkey shirt to church. Come on. See, he's ready to go. And I, man, I respect that. Thank you. There's a couple things I want to say before I, I get right into our series and get you home to watch the debacle at 12, as I have 
called it for today. But um, I, I, how many of you noticed the foyer in the new Welcome Center area renovation? Yeah. We are so thankful, and I, I just want to publicly thank some people who have spent many hours after work hours into the night uh, making that happen for us. And that's Marcus and Tasha Phelps and their family. Um, sometimes I sneak in on the, um, the cameras, you know, to make sure everybody's okay And 10 o'clock at night. Uh, I just wanted to evaluate how married couples work together outside of my home. You know what I'm saying? Because my wife and I need therapy about every other session on projects. So, uh, but they, they did great and uh, they're still happily married. I was informed this morning, but uh, I want to thank them. And then I want to thank uh, Tyler Mahon. I watched him. He didn't know. Uh, maybe you felt like somebody's watching you and you, I don't know if you prayed and said, Lord, I feel your presence, but it was me. I was watching you through the camera and uh, I watched him work until into after 11 o'clock after working all day, putting up the board on the wall. And um, you just deserve, all of you deserve a thank you. And we appreciate it so much. Yeah. And of course, Pastor Candace, our kids' pastor, she, she was here and uh, helping out as well. So to all of those guys and their families, just thank you all so much. We do appreciate it. And then also, I received news at about 2 o'clock or so this morning uh, that we now have our little super hooper has been born. Yeah. Mr. Oliver James Hooper has come into the world. And um, I predict in about two years, as you see him running around the church, we need to remember the, the kind and sweet little guy that just welcomed here because you know how they get. Uh, and somebody just thought, yeah, we've seen your grandkids. And I don't appreciate that thought, but I heard it. You know, Jesus, a lot of times when he was speaking, he would hear their thoughts, the Bible says, and he would just go ahead and answer them. I heard somebody talk about Pierce's. But uh, anyway, what a great day. It's Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving week. Come on. How exciting. I'm going to say something on behalf of all the men, which I try to do because I feel like sometimes our voices and wisdom are sequestered a little bit, especially during the holidays. And I have two things to say. Number one, um, this is not the meal to practice a new recipe. <laughs> Ladies are giggling. Men are scared to death to let their voice be heard laughing right now. But I know I'm right. This is the one time a year I get just turkey and cornbread dressing. Thank you. There was a brave soul right there. It's not the time to experiment. My wife loves to experiment. And, and uh, many times she'll fix a dish and I'll go, oh, this is absolutely amazing. Well, I'll never fix it again. I'm like, oh, you just found the one. And she said, well, you might like another one better, but I don't want to live my life in search of that. I'm getting older. Once you find it, you got to keep it. So that was the most important thing I wanted to say to all you ladies as I encourage you for Thanksgiving. And, and you guys, if you're helping cook too, don't be branching out this, this holiday. And secondly, and I'm going to send this to my daughter-in-laws and my daughter uh, in a text form come about Tuesday. If you're cooking and meeting your family for the meal, count how many people are going to be there and fix enough. Listen, mashed potatoes are golden at my house and macaroni and shells, okay? It is not the time to get a three-pound bag of mashed potatoes for 25-plus people. Y'all know what I'm saying? If it's not in a pot this big, you may not have heard the Lord direct you at the store. I'm just saying. But anyway, I love the holidays and I love to have fun and I hope you enjoy your family and remember just be the light for them. Show them the love and kindness of Jesus in you because I believe that is a, an opportune time to really grow together. Now, I've been talking in this series about living in God's presence and today, believe it or not, I'm going to title this sermon, His Thanksgiving. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 17 and then as I continue this series, 
you know I've really been talking about worship throughout this whole series, and we're talking about entering into God's presence and not from his presence. And if you remember when I talked about this, I was talking about we're, we're going out with his presence, not from it. And so that's why I titled this today, His Thanksgiving. And uh, since we are in the Thanksgiving season, I want you to know the, the, the pilgrims, they did what I'm going to talk about today. They gave thanks. You know, Thanksgiving, that, what that means is more than just a one-day holiday where you get off of work for the day and you overeat and you watch football on the couch and it's just a wonderful day. But it means more than that. It means giving thanks. And you can interchange those from thanksgiving to giving thanks. So as I told you a moment ago, as the pilgrims gave thanks, I encourage you, especially in your life, to be a person who gives thanks to God. You may not know where that phrase actually came from, and believe it or not, it did not show up in the Bible until we get into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's where it was first brought forth. And then you'll hear Jesus, he is actually the one who started the practice of giving thanks. When he broke the bread, it said, he gave thanks. So it came from Jesus himself, all right? So he's trying to teach us about that even daily provision from God is a gift from him. And we are to be thankful and we are to develop our life to be a people who give him thanks. In other words, he wants us to be grateful people. How many of you can say, I'm grateful for what God has done in my life? Yes. So if you'll turn to Luke chapter 17, I'm going to look mainly in this book, in this chapter. I'm going to be reading right now from uh, verse 11 through to 19, and I'm going to interject some things in between. But let's look here at verse 11. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, 10 men with leprosy who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And watch this. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them saw that he had been healed and he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And it goes on to say, and he was a Samaritan. That means he was he was the lowest of the low in that land. He was unworthy, yet he's falling at the feet of Jesus saying, thank you. And then Jesus, it says, responded, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give God glory except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. A little tidbit of information, all of those people who had leprosy that were healed were not lowly Samaritans. They were from all walks of life and cultures. Some of them were not the outcasts of society, and they knew, if nothing else, etiquette for how to be grateful, yet they did not come back. So I want to show you a few things about this uh, passage, and remember, we're talking again about living in his presence and about worship. So my first point is this, worship is giving thanks. If you want a very simple definition of worship, worship is giving thanks. Luke 17, let's go to verses 15 through 16 now. And I'm going to stay right here through the whole message. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, you remember I read that, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, and it ends with he was Samaritan. Okay, so worship is all about, listen to this, thanking someone after you received something. That's really what worship is. Worship is that you receive something from God, so you want to give him thanks. How many of you can say, I have in my life received something from God? 
And that's why we worship the way we do. We want to express, because remember last week I explained to you, love is expressed, right? So we want to come together on Sunday mornings as a group and we express our gratitude to him. That's how we express our love and and show him we're thankful. So please hear me that true, genuine love is always expressed. Maybe you grew up in a family. They They didn't hug it out. They didn't express a lot of love, okay? But you're in a new family now. The Bible says when you get saved, you're a new creation. You bring on a new family in your life. You may have had a dysfunctional father, but you had a but you now have a good father, a very good father, and you can express your love to him because you have received something from him. So express your love. Just think about it. Love has to be expressed. How many of you remember uh, when you first met uh, your significant other or someone in your life and uh, you eventually got to the place you got to hold hands. Y'all, some of y'all chuckle. You were beginning to express how you felt in your heart about that person. Is that right? You were expressing that level of love. And throughout all scripture, you're going to find out, I'm not trying to tell you as I share this, by the way, how to express your love or your worship to God. Keep that in mind because we all have different personalities, right? We do things differently. But I want you to understand when we talk about worship and giving thanks, the Bible in the Old Testament, it does give us some direction on how God says we express gratitude to him, okay? I'm going to share with you, there's 11 Hebrew words. I want to talk about seven of those. Okay, and I'm going to tell you what they mean here in just a moment, because these seven of the 11, they're dominant throughout Scripture. And uh, I want you to notice, as I give you the definition of these, uh, that uh, they all have a pattern to them. Look for the word thanksgiving or, or the, the direction to give thanks. So here's the seven words in Hebrew from the Old Testament. Number one is todah. And todah means a thanksgiving choir. That's actually the definition, by the way. It's a choir giving thanks. And again, it's not the holiday choir. It's a choir giving thanks, all right? And then number two, Barak. It means to kneel in thanksgiving or to bow down. Many times throughout Scripture, it's translated bow, okay? And number three, Tahila. To sing a song of thanksgiving. And make sure, if you talk about this this weekend with your family, to say it correctly. Don't say, now we're going to Gila and Uncle Jed brings the bottle out all excited. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, this not tequila. It's tequila. Yeah, we had a tequila time in my family. <laughs> to sing a song of thanksgiving. There's no, okay. I need to move on, okay? But have you ever been out there in your life, maybe when you weren't directly needing to be preaching in church, and you remember that Friday night after the Tahit, you know, all of a sudden karaoke was your sport. You know what I'm saying? When the tequila fell, singing began. You know what? I, I shouldn't have gone there. But tequila is the real thing, and it means singing. Uh, y'all forgive me for that, all you visitors. I'm just over, I'm over happy that it's Thanksgiving and my wife's going to fix me some cornbread dressing if my brother-in-law doesn't fix it the right way. That's a promise she made to me this morning. God bless her. So number four, hala. It means to give thanks by clamorously foolishness or by being clamorously foolish, like to give thanks. All right, so, and by the way, this is where we get the word. What is it, scholars? Hallelujah. That's where it comes from, this Hebrew root. And it means to rave to the point of being ridiculous or silly. In other words, fanatical dancing, jumping, shouting, and singing. And old, some of my old timers going to love this one, to draw attention. 
Well, they're just up there trying to draw attention. Yes. That's my answer from now. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. They're just drawing attention. Yes, you're on to it now. You get it. That's a Hebrew root word from God himself of how we are to carry ourselves when we offer gratitude to him. Think about it. Number five, yada. It means to give thanks with extended hands or to lift your hands in thanksgiving. You see, the reason we do that, we're offering our thanksgiving to him. We're presenting it. Lord, thank you so much. You've changed my life. I just want to say thank you. How many of you are seeing the pattern, by the way? You see it? Number six, zamar. It means to give thanks with a musical instrument. If you're Church of Christ, forgive me. I just blew your theology. (laughs) Although... If they said in our sermon a couple weeks ago, they'd say, well, you are the instrument of worship God created. So they got me on that one. But still, to give thanks with musical instruments. One of these days, we're going to introduce the level of people playing on this stage who bring worship to Farmersville. They're the top of the food chain musicians. They really are. They, They travel even today all over this country and the world playing with the biggest names in music but their heart they're here on Sunday mornings expressing their gift to him and you know in the old testament the bible said when god himself ordained the order of worship in the temple it said he demanded musicians who were highly skilled Little Billy Bob on his two-string guitar would not have been invited to lead the worship in the temple. Why? God demanded the best. That's why we have these musicians here. He deserves it. And I'm so thankful for all of them. It's all about giving thanks. Zamar. Shabbat. It means to give thanks in a loud tone. And there goes our Baptist quiet folk. I'm picking on everybody because we're everybody. We got it all here, right? We're Heinz 57. That's a country term. What kind of dog you got? Well, he's Heinz 57. Look, we're seeing that maybe God wants us to be excited about him just a little bit. Especially when we all come together and say thank you. But it means to give thanks with a loud tone and to shout Many times, shout to the Lord. There's one thing, notice they're all about. Look at her. That would have started eight-week revival in the little church I grew up in. <laughs> Listen, there's, there's some, it's about expressing our love, and they're all about giving thanks And I want you to hear me today. You will never be a true worshiper if you're not grateful. Gratitude is what causes our worship to come forth. And by the way, there's a verse in the Bible that has four of these seven words in one verse. I'm going to read it to you. Here we go. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's the word todah, which means a thanksgiving choir, and into his courts with praise, tehillah, singing praise. Be thankful, yada, which means extend your hands in gratitude to him and bless, barak, or bow before his name. Four of those words. Now, I'm going to paraphrase it how you would actually read it in the Hebrew. Enter his gates with a thanksgiving choir and enter his courts with singing praises. Extend your hands to him and bow before his name. That's what it means. Now, again, I'm not saying that we all have to do it in the same way. Again, we all have different personalities. I get that. But there are scriptural references of how to express worship. Bowing is in the Bible. Elbow somebody. I told you it's there. Shouting is in the Bible. 
Clapping is in the Bible. Extending your hands and lifting your hands. That's not a Pentecostal thing. It's a Bible thing. It's in the Bible. So worship is giving thanks and I want to worship God. So I need to give him thanks, which is my gratitude. Some of you may say, man, you're a radical church. The music's loud and they just want to draw attention to themselves by jumping around and yelling when they sing. And the right answer is yes. (laughs) We do go to a worshiping church. And as long as it is done in the Bible way, you will experience that here. Praise God. But there's something that causes our gratitude. And I want to talk about that a moment. There's, is there something that precedes gratitude? If I could ask you a question. Point two, miracles precede gratitude. According to this passage right here, miracles preceded the gratitude. Look again at Luke chapter 17, verse 15. Now, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, Okay, so he looks and, man, I'm healed. What did he do? He turned back glorifying God. How? With a loud voice. The reason he was grateful is because he had just received a miracle from God. And I want you to know if anyone's here who they know have received a miracle from God, you cannot keep them quiet. Nor can you explain to them it really wasn't God. We come together and we give thanks. You give it up in the morning. Give him thanks. I thank him every day. I wake up. I say, God, thank you for waking me up this morning, keeping me safe last night. And I thank you for your mercies that are new every day because I realize, and my wife will amen this, I need those new mercies every day. (laughs) I do. I know that about myself. And that guy did it with a loud voice. So my question to you is this. Was his action appropriate? I think it was. You see, few of us really know about leprosy. We've seen it in the movies. We've heard it in the Bible. But leprosy, to them, of course, it's a disease. And in essence, it's an autoimmune disease. I probably said that wrong. Say it to me. What is it? Tell me. You're my little doctor. An infectious disease, which is why... They were, if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you were put in what they called leprosy colonies. You were not allowed to associate with people because they, they believed it was highly contagious. And what did it do? It began to eat their digits away in the skin. It, the body would begin attacking itself, destroying itself. So when it says these men, they had leprosy, they were doomed to die a lonely death, painful death, Okay. You could not associate with them. They couldn't associate with their family. They couldn't go to church. They were just there to stay away and die. And if you happen to get too close to any of them, they would have to shield away and scream, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. You couldn't go to your kids' ball games. Some of you, after about five or six years of that all day, you're thinking, ah, (laughs) I've sat through all the tournaments, I know. But you couldn't do those things. You couldn't have that new dressing recipe this Thanksgiving. But this man, he had leprosy. He had no hope. And Jesus healed him. So again, I ask, was it appropriate that he would fall on his face and with a loud voice give Jesus thanks? Of course it was. And I dare say if any of us had a disease and Jesus healed us, would it be appropriate for you? To fall at his feet and just to loudly thank him for healing you. Well, weren't we already healed of a disease that sends us to death? It's called sin. And Jesus came and he brought absolute healing to protect us from the sin that the enemy brought over our lives. So it's okay if you want to express your love to God... And it's completely appropriate. Okay? So gratitude is worship. Worship is being grateful. And gratitude comes from miracles. So 
me being who I am, I see the pattern in this process, okay? So I ask a question. Is there something that can actually cause a miracle? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? If something could spark a miracle in my life, I think it'd be great. Well, point number three, obedience precedes miracles. And I want you to stay with me until I get to the final of this point, because I'm going to address some of the yeah buts, okay? I'm not saying that we can earn them, but I want you to look at Luke eleven fourteen. So when he, Jesus, or 17, 14, when he, Jesus, saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was as they went, what happened? They were cleansed. They weren't cleansed when Jesus spoke. Did you notice that? They were cleansed as they obeyed. And as they did, go show themselves to the priest, okay? They could have said, well, we're not healed yet. The law says we can't be around anyone until we're healed. But they didn't, did they? They immediately started walking toward the priest to show them they were cleansed. Even though when they took their first step, guess what? They weren't cleansed yet, but they obeyed. And that's what I want to say in this point. Their obedience, we must have obedience to God in our lives to enjoy the benefits of who he is. He does not operate outside of obedience. Everybody hear that? No matter what you're asking for. Lord, I need a miracle of my finances. Well, Mark, you seem to have forgotten. I said this much is mine. Right? I know I'm being disobedient, but God, if you could drop me a hundy right here so I can, I can get out of this restaurant because I'm embarrassed. He's going to be like my wife's mother who, uh, if you ran out of gas or didn't have the money and you were out gallivanting around and you called her, she'd say, well, figure it out. <laughs> That's tough love. <laughs> so... You realize how much this pattern is in the Bible. Let me show you some other examples, okay? He said to Moses, lift up your rod when he had to cross the Dead Sea. And Moses could have said, well, the army's right back there. Do we have time for this? Can you just split the water? But God said, do what I told you to do. And what happened? Oh, we're going to have to have some Bible studies in this church. Okay, there's some movies out there, and most of them are wrong. But there's one about Moses, and, and if you go to the Dead Sea, watch that part. He struck the, the rod, he extended it, what he was supposed to do that God told him, and all of a sudden the waters made a wall, and they walked across on dry land. That's, that's that one, okay? There was another time the children of Israel were standing before the River Jordan, and uh, he told them to do something different. This time, he said, tell the priests to put their feet in the water. And then I'll part the water. The funny thing was that river was in flood stage. Y'all know what flood stage looks like in Texas, right? We have no rain, then we have eight inches of rain, and it looks like rapids. And the cars, it's so weird, but you see that one smart one in the van. And if that's been you, I apologize. That's just what I was thinking at this moment. But they go ahead and drive into the water. And the water's up over their driving window, and they're like in a tall van. And what happens to that van most of the time? And I know what you're thinking when you're watching it, because that's why we go to NASCAR, too. We're waiting on the okay? But all of a sudden, that van starts moving, and you see suddenly it, it can roll over, and it's completely out of control. That's what the water was doing when God said, put your feet in the water. How many of you would have jumped in? Me neither. I like to think I would for the sake of being holy and, you know, and all that, but... I would have watched somebody. I would have said, Pastor Frank, you do it first, and I'll be right behind <laughs> The pattern's all through Scripture. They said to Jesus, what'd they say? Come down off the cross that we may see and believe. They wanted to see the miracle before they would believe. But Jesus, remember what he said? He said, believe, and then you'll see. It's backwards. I'm not asking what's God telling you to do that you're doing I'm asking you, has he told you to do something that you're not obeying? His ways are not our ways. His methods are not our methods. 
And the answer to that question in your life could release whatever miracle you need. And if it does, it will release a gratitude in you, which will release worship from you. And I believe context in Scripture matters, okay? So I'm going to show you the context. Many times in the first 10 verses, we don't associate what I'm fixing to share with you with the story of the 10 lepers. All right? But I want you to look with me because Jesus did something interesting. He starts talking about what feels like nothing to do with the story of the lepers. But watch this, Luke 17, 1. He begins talking about offenses in the first five verses and then the offender in the second five. Luke 17, 1. Jesus told his disciples, situations that cause people to lose their faith are certain to arise. How horrible it will be for the person who causes someone to lose his faith. It would be best for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large stone hung around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to lose his faith. Well, that's pretty stout, isn't it? Then he says, so watch yourselves. In other words, don't be that person. If a believer sins, correct him. If he changes the way he thinks and acts, forgive him. And if he wrongs you seven times in one day and comes back to you seven times, boy, this is tough, especially for Texans, and says he's sorry, what are we supposed to do? Yeah, that's kind of like a whisper answer, wasn't it? Yeah, it's tough. But here's what the apostle said to that. Give us more faith. And there's something important in this exchange between Jesus and the disciples that's very appropriate for us. So before I go to this next part, I want you to catch that phrase. Remember that they said, give us more faith to help them forgive, okay? And here's what Jesus said. Listen, guys, people are going to offend you. They're going to offend you. How many of you have been offended by somebody in the last two weeks? And then he says, but I want you to forgive them. You understand? When someone offends you, forgive them. And here's probably what the disciples said. Well, okay, we can do that. But Jesus wasn't finished talking. He said, no, no, I'm not finished. If the same guy does the same thing seven times on the same day, then what? You are still, this is Jesus talking, to forgive him. And then they went, yeah, we need more faith. You see it? So no, most people don't put that verses 1 through 5 with this story. But if someone sins against you, first thing is forgive. So they said we need more faith. Now watch Jesus' response as he continues this conversation in verses 6 through 10. The Lord said, in other words, because they answered we need more faith, he said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, In other words, just a small amount of faith. You can say to that mulberry tree, pull yourself up by the roots, plant yourself in the sea, and it would, watch this, obey you. And again, maybe you've never connected these two things to this story, but suppose, Jesus said, someone has a servant, it's very important, who is plowing fields or watching sheep. How many of you realize in those days the servants were told what to do. They, get, they were given their duties, okay? And that's what Jesus is explaining. Your servant is out there doing their job. Does he tell his servant when he comes back in from the field, have something to eat? No. Instead, he tells his servant, get dinner ready for me. After you serve me my dinner, you can eat yours. Now that seems harsh, but he's teaching us a lesson. He doesn't thank the servant for following orders and that's the way it is with us Jesus is saying look when you've done everything you're ordered to do you say hey I'm supposed to do that there's nothing great about me because I did what I was told to do you don't deserve a trophy for just doing what you're told to do that's what Jesus is saying we've only done our duty now think about this Jesus said you need to forgive people And they said, we're going to need the faith to do it. But here's what he said. You don't need faith. You just need to do what you're told. If somebody's offended you, 
It takes no great prayer and moments of meditation feeling the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. He's already told you. It's a command. It's not a faith step. He said, forgive. Yeah, but God, what if they just keep doing it? Seven times a day in the same day? Forgive. You see that it requires obedience to forgive, not an emotional state. Pretty powerful. That's from Jesus. I know that's strong. And that's why the disciples said, man, we got to have faith for that. Here's what we need to do. Do what we're told. That's what Jesus said. So now I'm going to say this. He told them to go show yourselves. They obeyed. And for those of you who need miracles in your life, and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and say healing. I'm not saying that if you're waiting on a miracle, you're not in obedience with God. But what I am saying, the first step in any interaction of asking God to deliver us is making sure we are obedient to what he's told us to do. Because if you don't get past that step, there's nothing else on the way for you except the same circle until you deal with it. Obedience. So I realize we can't earn that miracle. And I'm not saying that. Listen, we live in a fallen world. I've been there in my own life. But I think many times, even according to this passage, I've had to think, Lord, what are you telling me to do? You ever been in a mess and it's just like, God, what are you saying to me? Because I keep living in this. And once you know you're walking in obedience, you then, you follow the direction. And this, this may be some of you today. When you look at your life, say, like, look, I believe I'm in obedience to all God has told me to do. That's great. But there's a scripture for you. Because sometimes we need to realize God's ways are not our ways. Not everyone gets to heaven completely healed of diseases. Some people limp for the rest of their life. Some people lose toes and have to walk without their toes. Some people lose limbs. Some people die of diseases. But here's a verse for those of you. If that is your walk, is to walk through a process. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. Does it say defeat the evil day? What does it say? withstand what does that mean that means no matter what hell is coming your way God's going to give you the strength to stand in the midst of it and he says look put on the whole armor of God that shield of faith that helm of the salvation the sword of the spirit the belt of truth your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace you wear a garment of praise which will remove a spirit of heaviness and when you know you've done all of that Stand firm. And that's the hardest part, right? When you know your life is in order and you've prayed and you've fasted and you desperately desire that miracle and he says, stand. And that is the promise he gives us in all that we do. But I do want you to know if you'll do what Jesus tells us to do, we will see miracles. And I'm not just talking about physical healing. I'm talking about relationships restored. I'm talking about children who've been acting like knuckleheads. Coming back to the home in the right mind. Miracles of all kinds. Personalities can even change when God works a miracle. And when I see miracles coming in my life, I develop that attitude of gratitude. And I'm fixing to pray today. And then when I have gratitude, I give thanks to the Lord. And this is the pattern God wants in our lives. So I'm going to ask you a question about that leper. And I'm going to bring it to modern times. Suppose there was that man in Dallas. God delivered him. Did something in his life. He was healed. And for 30 years, he lives his life. Marries, has children. He's successful. But one day, he's on his way to Golden Corral. And while he's in the parking lot, he looks over at the mashed potato section 
and he sees Jesus, the one who healed him. Would it be appropriate for him to run over, even though it's been 30 years, and say, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me way back then? Yes, it would. And that's what we do every Sunday. But I'm wanting us to extend it pathway. I want us to do it every day. Build an altar of gratitude in your life every day. Because he did heal you. Satan's plan is to get our minds off of what God has done. But if we will have a life of worship and gratitude, we will always be looking to him. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as I prepare to close today. And let's just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in my life? Maybe it could be someone who does need to research their heart. David said, Lord, search my heart. See if there's any wickedness in me. And if there is, Lord, lead me in your way everlasting. Maybe there's unforgiveness somewhere. Whatever it may be, you know, you, it's very difficult to fool ourselves. So if you see something, just say, Lord, I give this to you right now. I turn away from the wrong, whatever I was doing, whatever it is, and I just give it to you. Because I want to be in right standing with you. And Father, I pray for that person that their miracle would come. In whatever capacity their life needs. And then I pray for the one who's right with you. They've done everything correctly. Yet they're afflicted in some manner. Whether it's relationships, physically, financially. Whatever it may be, Lord. But they're right with you. Then I pray their faith would be encouraged to stand in the midst of the face of adversity. Give them the joy and the peace that comes knowing your presence is right there with them. And let them stand and carry themselves through the process of life, whatever those steps are ordered by you, with gratitude so others would see your light in them. And finally, Lord, I pray for the one that doesn't know you. If they're here today, that they would sense your love for them and they would give their heart to you. In the name of Jesus.